Uh, I'm going to start out here. It's going to be about the same thing he just said uh, with a deal that the Fort Aransas Chamber of Commerce put together. Uh, i got to remember to point that thing at this thing at that thing to make all this work. It's one of the best kept secrets in the whole United States. The fishing we have right here in Port Aransas rivals anything I ever saw in thousands of islands. Well, I grew up here since 1963 is when we moved here permanently. You tell people you're from an island off the Texas coast and they kind of scratch their head. A friend of mine and I that really liked to fish, we would go to the dock at about 5.30 in the morning to Woody's specifically. After a couple of years of hauling stuff down the dock for tips, Woody decided to offer me a job, worked eight hour days. And then after a couple of years of that, his deckhand didn't show up and he grabbed me to go fishing with him and I ended up working for him for nine years and got my captain's license and was off to the races after that. I've traveled all over the world, 30-something different countries and thousands of islands for quite a few years, built a mothership in France, and we carried a 42-foot sport fishing boat on deck, and that's the boat we did the round the world world record fishing expedition. And I believe we set 11 world records. When we were doing it, it was so full of rock and roll all the time, you know, we were gone. We didn't know all the things actually that we had accomplished. Did it for about 20 years and it was a great life, but after a while you want a post office box, address, telephone number. <laughs> this is a fish they caught right here. I think this was maybe the first marlin ever landed in Port Aransas, or one of the first two or three. And uh, this is the mothership that I ran, the 165-footer with the 42-footer on back. I ran two of America's top 100 yachts and one of the world's top 100 yachts. Mega yachts. <laughs> Ended up as tournament director, and this just kind of fell into this, just a natural progression from everything else I've done. All righty. Here's, here's one on the left for you. There's one on the right. Uh, the Texas Legends Tournament. Uh, this past year, we had 36 boats and uh, over $800,000 in prize money that we gave out. Outstanding fishing. It's really growing fast and turning into the tournament that everybody wants to fish. And uh, then we have other tournaments like the Deep Sea Roundup that are family oriented, every man tournaments. There's a lot of different tournaments. I think fishing is a great way to bring people together. Well, it's pretty clear. Everybody in the family can be involved and friends. It brings friends together. There's a real wide variety of species. Uh, one boat last week caught 20 different species on one trip. We also have an outstanding flounder season that starts in the fall. And then offshore in the summer months, you have all the pelagic species, what a lot of people call mahi-mahi, uh, kingfish, jackfish, blue marlin. They're the biggest fish in the sea. Well, a lot of us here are real salty people. It's just a term being good at living a life from the sea. Oh, absolutely. I'm as salty as they get. Well, I'm Captain B. Wallace. All right, they think I'm pretty special <laughs> for some reason. Not sure why. Uh, Okay, click. There we go. This is the way fishing was done for tarpon in the 1890s in Port Aransas. Well, 
there wasn't really a town here then. The settlement was over on St. Joe. Uh, there's a, the first documented um, tarpon catch on rod and reel was in Florida in 1885. And that came from a New York newspaper. Now, we had a, uh, that's another picture from 1904. Uh, we had, yep, i back up here. It's hard for me to believe that uh, there wasn't a fish caught in Port Aransas before that. This, this is what they called a knuckle, knuckle buster reel. The drag is made out of wood and it presses on the edges of the handle. You got a fish running on this, you get your hands close to it, you get your knuckles busted. I'm gonna let y'all play with that. Pass it down the, down the way. Uh, Anyway, that was, that was the way it was done. But I'm going to start uh, with modern sport fishing boats and work backwards. Because I just thought that might be the best way to do it. This is, this is a Bayless 77. These are considered the Rolls Royce of sport fishing boats today. It is a, uh, a coal molded plywood hull. That's where each of the plies is resin infused and stacked one on top of the other. The hull is thick. And uh, then it's plastic bagged. A bag is put all around it with suction hoses all around it that suck all the air out of the wood and makes a very superior and strength weight hull. Hmm. This boat cruises it. Well, it, it'll reach speeds in excess of 40 knots, but he can cruise about a thousand miles at 30. I don't remember how much fuel they hold. Uh, six people and four crew can travel the world and luxury. Catch them up, mucho billfish. Nowadays, blue marlin is considered the, uh, you know, the big heavy tackle game fish. In the 1800s, you know, the, the Kiowas were still, and Comanches were still raiding in Texas in the 1870s. So it wasn't long from the, from the Kiowas to the, uh, to tarpon fishing here in Port Aransas. Uh, Megalop, Megalops Atlanticus is the scientific name for tarpon. They're giant herring. Um, they're very uh, ancient prehistoric fish. Uh, these modern boats, that's a life-size carving of a black marlin, a striped marlin feeding, hand-carved. All the doors are air on cabinets and stuff are air actuated. You touch a certain spot with your toe or your finger and the door just opens and it closes when you touch it again. Behind the walls, those panels behind the walls is tackle storage. There's tackle storage all over that boat. You never see a rod and reel. There's a place designed for every glass, every cup, every piece of silverware, so nothing rattles when you're out bouncing around in the sea. Uh, I don't know exactly how much it costs, but I think they, they may have exceeded their $6 million budget by a million or two. <laughs> Yeah, just so happens my little brother's the captain of it. I got him started fishing when he was pretty young. 2,000 horsepower MTU engines, twin engines. It's clean as the hospital. Probably cleaner than the hospital.
you can see why they consider them the Rolls Royce of sport fishing boats. Not many, uh, about 12 or 15 right now. You talking about the Bayless boats? 12, maybe 12. There's uh, freezer space under all these seats and under that table. It's all freezer space for bait. See, they're doing what we were doing 30 years ago. They can do it on one boat. They can go to the far points of the world and fish without the aid of a mothership. They are their own mothership. The electronics, they got Starlink satellite communications, which I've heard some guys say is better than, uh, you know, the TV and uh, uh, email and, you know, getting online is better than what they have at home. It has a side scan sonar system that they use to hunt for bait. And, uh, stop. Oh, I forgot we can't restart it. That's okay. I'll go to the next one after this. There's not much left anyway. Um, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, the side scan sonar. They use it to search for bait. It searches around and around, and you can set how deep it's searching. And you can home in on a school of bait, and, and it will track it. It will stay on it. And then around that bait, you can home in on individual fish and distinguish them from the cloud of bait. And you can pick out a big fish and actually watch it eat your bait. It, I'm serious. I mean, it's just incredible. They, they get out there around these rigs. Uh, that's Perdido. That's 150 miles offshore. But guys go out there around those rigs, and they'll go around the rig until they find a big fish, they'll lock onto it, and they'll just follow that fish and keep using different kinds of baits and different tactics until they either the, the fish goes into a feeding period or they trigger its feeding instinct to bite their hook. Um, the, in, the, in the fishing tournaments, some of these big boats now run all the way off Louisiana if that happens to be where the, where the uh, Currents look right, once again, from satellite feed. Uh, you can read water temperatures and uh, uh, plankton. You, there's so much you know, information out there these days. Anyway, some, some of the boats run all the way to Louisiana to fish a three-day fishing tournament. They leave on Thursday and come back on Saturday. They might run 300 miles to go fish. Some of them succeed, some of them don't. And that's where that $800,000 prize money can be awful tempting, you know. And, you know, it's bragging rights for these guys that can afford boats like that. They want to beat their buddy. Okay, we're going to go back a little bit more. In the 80s and 90s, the 60-foot Hatteras and the 54-foot Bertram, they were the battle wagons of that time period. They cruised at about 22 knots. So about a third slower than the, you know, the competitive boats these days. Uh, there were competitions between, there was a fishing tournament in, um, in the Bahamas. They had it at different islands at different times. Between Bertram and Hatteras, they called it the Bertram Hatteras Shootout. I'm going to pass this reel around. This is an ADW. It's built for 80 pound class line. It's like a fine watch. It's heavy. This 130 we have up here, this is for, whoops, for a 130 pound line. The rod and reel alone weighs 20 pounds. So, you know, you got to be mucho macho to fight a fish for sometimes six, eight hours with one of these things. Uh, these are capable of putting all the way up to 85 or 90 pounds of drag on a fish. It is considered necessary to have 50 to 60 pound drag uh, to bring up what we call a grander, a thousand pounder. And that's like living the dream to catch a thousand pounder. I'm going to 
I'm going to just let y'all come up and look at this afterwards. I'm not going to try. Somebody's liable to get hurt. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> those were the, <clears throat> the big deal through the, <clears throat> I don't know, from the 70s all the way uh, up through the, uh, well, up to, up to, I don't know, Bertram Italian Company bought them out and tried to make them more European, and they, they're not even competitors anymore. Hatteras is getting back in there, but uh, a lot of the custom boats, uh, you know, such as the Bayless and Viking, Viking is a big, uh, a big uh, you know, manufactured boat. Uh, you know, like one model, they'll all be the same. Custom boats, everyone's different. But, you know, 77 Viking, all of them look the same. All right, where are we going now? Okay, this is what everybody's after. Blue Marlin. There's nothing in the world that can describe a Blue Marlin when he's fighting. They'll, they'll do tricks that you can't believe. And every one of them's different. They're like people. I can't tell you how many of them I've weighed, but some of them are big in the belly, some of them are big in the shoulders, and some of them are big back aft. <laughs> but that's what everybody's out there looking for. They get up to 1,600 pounds. Uh, a thousand pounder, like I said, is called a grander. And uh, I'm personally believe there's tonners out there, and that's what I was looking for when I was fishing for them. I kind of I quit fishing two years ago. Uh, okay, now we're going to the, the mothership era. This is the French look. Uh, there were some guys starting to build some uh, motherships. The first one, really, was the madam and the hooker operation. They tried carrying their boat on deck, and they just couldn't do it. They had a 110-foot boat. And it just wasn't big enough to carry the hooker. Uh, so they ended up towing it. But I, they set close to 70 world records by being able to go to places where there were no marinas and no facilities and no town and, and stay there and chase the fish. That was actually taken down in the, uh, the uh, Darien Gap down in Panama, down in the jungle revolutionaries, all kinds of crap was going on down there when we were down there. The French look would sleep 20 people. Uh, we had a French chef. It took nine minutes to launch or retrieve the game. We call it a game boat, the sport fish boat. Um, we built it to uh, be able to travel 2,000 miles and uh, stay on station or in an area and fish for three months uh, with unassisted. We sure miss fresh vegetables sometimes, though. Um, I think we set 11 world records, Madam and the Hooker. Uh, Jerry Dunaway was the owner of this boat. Uh, they focused a lot on women's world records because of his wife, uh, Deborah really liked to fish. I think she set 39 world records, and he set 19. They beat us to a lot of those spots. This is a picture of a, uh, just to give you an idea of size, that's a marlin we, uh, we caught off West Africa that was 1,157 pounds. Um, uh, record fish have to be weighed on shore. They can't be weighed from a boat, even though we had a crane and the facilities to do it on the boat. To be eligible for a record, it has to be weighed on land. So I had to go find a truck with a crane on it to pick that thing up. And we ended up fishing there, and we caught five granders. The first one we gave to the hospital. They told me they would, could consume that fish in three meals. The second one, we never expected to catch, you know, well, we wanted to catch one, but I never dreamed I'd really catch one, 1,000 pounder anyway. And uh, the second one we gave to the orphanage. 
And uh, they were about the same way, you know, people from all over, or uh, I guess, you know, Catholic countries, for, girls from all over Europe go there to have their kids, I guess. A uh, place where nobody know where they were at, but there were about 1,200 kids in that orphanage. And uh, the third fish, as I was elbow deep in, you know, filleting it with a machete, uh, I said, boy, I bet those kids sure would like to have a cow. <laughs> Too bad. Oh, I got to back up a little bit. Uh, when we went there, it's illegal for anybody but Portuguese citizens to fish in Portuguese waters. And they had no word in the Portuguese language for sport fishing. You know, you're fishing, you're fishing to either sell it or eat it. I mean, you don't, tur you don't turn them loose. And I had to go try and talk these guys into letting me fish in their waters and they're like, and tell them we're going to turn everything loose unless we think it might be some kind of record. And they're like, yeah, you want us to believe that? <laughs> You're going to turn these big fish loose? Anyway, through translators and $100 bills, we finally convinced them to give us a fishing license. <laughs> uh, what we got next? Uh, they, uh, I had another story going there, and I kind of lost it. Uh, oh, third fish. As I had fish, those, they, they're very oily fish, and I mean, everything's just covered with grease. It's like butter, you know, and I, had, I was straddling that fish, trying to cut a fillet in a chunk small enough for somebody to handle, and uh, anyway... I said that, and there were a couple of other boats that tied up beside us. And uh, one of my greatest achievements, in my opinion, was that uh, we got together and we got the orphanage a commercial fishing license. So all of the fish we caught went to the market, and they got all the money for it. I have letters from the orphanage thanking me and stuff. Anyway, we should have taken a picture of that letter. I didn't think about it. I showed the letter to Miss Gracie there. We should have taken a picture of it and put it up here. Um, okay, now we're going back up again. Or, uh, that's the Mustang. That's the first headboat in Port Aransas and my first deckhand job. Uh, I could barely, I couldn't really reach over the rail. I could gaff a fish and hold it until Butch, the captain, could get there and take it away from me. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, he had me driving the boat, you know, because I wasn't good for much else, I guess. But he had me driving pretty quick, so I picked it all up pretty quick. I think it kind of came natural to me. I don't know. <clears throat> okay, where are we going next? We're back to Perdido. That's the Hasta Luego at Perdido. The rig is much bigger than that. The boat, it, the, it, the, the depth perception is kind of off, but... That rig is much bigger than it appears in that picture, but the Hasta Luego was a pink Viking that I ran for 11 years. <clears throat> I'm going to have to get some talking fluid here. Uh, we, we won a lot of money on that boat. <clears throat> we won Poco Bueno, which is it's, it's gone now, but that was one of the most prestigious. That, was, that reel floating around here somewhere was one of my trophies. Uh, we won a third of a million in that tournament, and uh, I got a pretty good chunk of it. Uh, okay, we're going back up again. 19, what year? We, we just, 60. This is the nitwits. Oh, she put those things up there so I wouldn't have to ask. <laughs> this boat is the, nit, is the nitwits. And uh, it was the first fiberglass uh, sport fishing boat ever made. It was a Hatteras. And uh, I remember the first 41 Hatteras that pulled in here was owned by a guy named Dr. Webb Detar. It was called the Deep Blue. <coughs> and when he pulled in down here to the wharf, you know, everybody in town, everybody used to go to the wharf you know, every afternoon in the summertime to see the boats come in. That's just where everybody went, what everybody did. That's just part of life. Matthews is what it was called. It's where, it was where Virginia's is now. And that dock, you'll see pictures of that dock, that front dock there has been there since about 1900, or a dock has been there. 
<coughs> anyway, the Nitwits was one of the very first fiber or the first fiberglass production boat, uh, sport fishing boat designed. Okay, now we're going to back up. Okay, there wasn't much changed before the the Miss Chevy. Do we have the Miss Chevy next? The Miss Chevy Two. This was this was John Rybovich's first boat. John Rybovich also owned a shipyard in uh, Fort or Palm Beach, Palm Beach, and uh, he is credited with being the father of the modern sport fishing boat. Okay, this was his first boat in 1953. He started that was a you know a plank boat and uh, built out of wooden planks. <coughs> the gin pole, what, what's called a gin pole, going up and down right there, that's what they used to haul big fish in the boat. It had a block and tackle on it, and they'd hoist them up on that and then try and swing them in the boat. Um, anyway, everybody says he's the father of the modern sport fishing boat, but I have to disagree. Uh, I think it was Fred Farley myself. Uh, I got I got next slide up here so I can remember Pilar. Okay, pre before this time, there were lots of boat sport fish boats built that were one offs. You know, guy'd build a boat, especially up around North Carolina area. He'd build a boat in the winter time, but it was a whole lot like a shrimp boat hull oh, and. Uh, you know, they, they, all of them were different. Nobody was building them, you know, as a company before John, or supposedly before John Robovich. It's kind of the same with them claiming the first tarpon over there. I kind of have to disagree with that, too. Um, before that, people bought existing yachts and customized them into sport fishing boats, which is what the Pilar Hemingway's 1934 Wheeler Playmate was what it was called. They called that style of boat a commuter boat. And what they were made for was running back and forth, you know, rich people running back and forth across Long Island Sound. Uh, it had a Chrysler 75 horsepower engine, which was in the 40s or you know, late 40 late 40s that was the um, that was the engine of choice for the Farley boats okay this is the tarpon club and and I'm real bad on dates so late 1890s a guy built a tarpon club over on St. Joe you know once again you think the guy built, they'd only been catching fish here for a couple of years for him to build this big, beautiful club and call it the Tarpon Club for people to come down here and go fishing for tarpon and trout and redfish. And duck hunting was big. Duck hunting was real big here at that time period. It was gone in 1904, but these people lived in the lap of luxury there. Uh, it was, you know, people had to be pretty well to do to even get here. You had to come by steamboat from New Orleans or Galveston and you had to or the San Antonio Aransas Pass Railroad and uh, you know come down here and fish out of a rowboat. People gave him a hard time. Just another picture. This is just another picture of people fishing out there. I think that's the tarpon club in the background so they were off the beach over on St. Joe. Uh, people had to be pretty well to do uh, to get here and go fishing. Um, once again, you can see the rod they used. That's the kind of rod they used. That knuckle buster reel was what was what was going on. This became. Uh, this became the uh, epicenter, I can't think of a better word, 
the epicenter for heavy tackle fishing for the whole world. There was one up, you know, they caught some fish in Florida. Got to give them credit for it. Uh, some of our most famous guides came from Florida because there were more fish here than there were over there. All right, they, you know, they, there were thousands and thousands of them. When you hear the old timers talk about them, you know, it almost sounds like you could walk on them sometimes, migrating up the coast. A lot of theories about what happened to the tarpon. I think, uh, you know, there, I think all these theories, they probably all count for something. Uh, one of the best ones I've heard, or, you know, makes a lot of sense to me, is they used to dynamite them in the rivers in Mexico to use for fertilizer. Another picture. You know, that can't, you know, that's a good way to get rid of a whole bunch of them fast. I'm sure that uh, a lot of the other things, DDT, damming the rivers, I'm sure there's a lot of other things that had to do with it, but I bet you that dynamite them for fertilizer was one of the best ones. Uh, I can't read the date on that or if it has one, but that's a colorized old photograph. Looks like they got it pulled up on the beach over at St. Joe on a pretty calm day. Um, but there just wasn't any other way to get them. People used to get really dressed up. I mean, they got decked out. Can you imagine getting dressed up like that to go fishing nowadays? Woo. People be having some funny thoughts about you. There's another one. She's pretty dressed up. She's pretty sharp. Uh, Edgar Norse Dreyer is the guy that's standing there. Uh, Dennis Dreyer Harbor is named after his brother. Lloyd Dreyer, to me, was one of my idols. He was flat. What was that? That Trey Gowdy, that show. I'm not Trey Gowdy. Uh, that show that the guy used to be on, Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom. Lloyd Dreyer was on that show fly fishing for sailfish in uh, Cozumel, Mexico, when I was young. I mean, really young. And I remember seeing that on, watching that on Saturday morning or Sunday morning whenever it came on, and I was just wowed. But he was way ahead of his time. He also ran, uh, there were a lot of the wealthier people in Texas had Rybovich's here in Port Aransas. And uh, he ran one of them for the lady that actually caught the first blue marlin caught off Texas, uh, Mary O'Connor. Uh, no, I I'm pretty sure it was Mary O'Connor. I know her last name was O'Connor. But she had a, had a Rybovich built, and he ran it. He also helped Rybovich change the way that their hull was constructed. They used to chine walk. They had a keel, a deep keel. And they were twin engine, but they used to chine walk. They, what that means is when you get on plane, you kind of roll back and forth from one chine to the other. And after they sea trialed it, the first or, first or second time, he took a saw and cut about four inches off the bottom of the keel and cured the keel walking problem. He was with the life-saving station. That's another thing i got to say. A lot, of the, a lot of the original guides were part of the life-saving station that later became the Coast Guard, but a lot of the guides, that's where they, they came from. And the guys that were building the jetties in the 20s were a big driving force in, in the charter fishing industry here because they were here and they didn't have anything to do when they weren't working. They wanted to go fishing. They got out there seeing those tarpon rolling all day. They wanted to get into some of that stuff. Um, the reel, that's a pin reel, but uh, it's not a lot different. That's a pin squitter, I think, that she's using. It's not a lot different than that one that's going around, except it did have a drag. Now, these reels, this other thing up here with the string wrapped around it, that's a line dryer. Back there, I've been told that, uh, that they use 36-pound linen line, and that's what's on that spool. But they had to take it off every day and dry it. Otherwise, it would rot. Uh, Anyway, so hence the line drying spool. Um, okay, the, the people at, at the Tarpon Club over on St. Joe, uh, the guy that owned it, now his name 
uh, evades me right now. I was afraid I'd forget everything I knew when I got up here, but seemed to be doing okay so far. Uh, they gave him a hard time about it took so long, so much of their day rowing out to the pass and back that he had, oh, that's in the right one. We'll get there. But he had a, this, these are Farley boats, okay? Uh, these are typical Farley boats. The first four are definitely, or the first three, four, are definitely Farley boats. This is a Farley boat. I'm not so sure about this one. This is a Farley boat, but that's just a typical, typical boat. This was, that say, 36, 1936. Um, I'm going to read this because uh, I can't remember it word for word, but there's a guy uh, that wrote a book called Fishing the Atlantic, uh, Kip Farrington. He wrote the book in 1939, <clears throat> and he said... Describing Farley boats, he wrote, Port Aransas is one of the few places I know of where small, compact speedboats are constantly used for saltwater fishing. The Aransas fleet is most spectacular and is always kept in fine condition. And that's, 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 a, that's a hell of a compliment right there. For a captain, that's something you want to hear. Um, where do we go from here? Okay, the Silver Sailfish Derby. R.H. Green, yep, you're right. I was going to buy that book and read it before this thing started, but I didn't have time. I got a book about it over there. I can't wait to read it. Uh, I got a book over there in the museum. Um, the... Uh, Whoops, did I pass one? Yeah, the Silver Sailfish Derby um, in Palm Beach has claimed to be the oldest fishing tournament in the world also. They started in 1933. The Deep Sea Roundup started in 1932. I, there's just some disconnect between what Florida has to say and the actual facts <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Their bullshit switch got flipped pretty hard. Uh, but you can see, once again, all the different boats. There's no two alike. They're probably going about 12, 14 knots. They're not very fast at all. All righty. Uh, this was the grand champion of the... Uh, this is Fred Farley's granddaughter. She was the grand champion of the uh, Deep Sea Roundup in 1974. Heavy. Heavy tackle division. Yeah, she happens to be sitting here in the front row. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty good undertaking. Her and a girl named Pat Hahn, who also got inducted into the Texas Saltwater Fishing Hall of Fame, used to go out there and give those blue marlin hell. And I'll tell you, I got to hand it to them. I know some of the weather they went out in. They went out in some weather that was pretty spicy. And you notice she's got a shirt on when her and Pat would go fishing and they bring, when they, we killed everything back then. I mean, you didn't let nothing live. And uh, whenever her and Pat were bringing in fish, they'd run their bikini tops out the, up the outrigger, so they had to be wearing a shirt when they came, when they got to the dock. <laughs> You didn't think I'd tell them that, did you? <laughs> but we were always on the watch when that wolverine came in to see what was up the outrigger. <laughs> the wolverine was the name of the boat. Okay, I'm checking my, some of my... I'm, I'm so far off my notes here that I guess it don't matter. Okay, I had the definition of a skiff here, but I don't know if I still have it or not. But a, the definition of a skiff is a small boat operable by one man, or that is one that I've seen. I've seen several definitions, but I like that one the best because that's what the Farley Tarpon skiffs were. All right, uh, 
This was not an early uh, Farley boat. Uh, this is probably from the era where they used, looks like a 50s model. And you can see the uh, aircraft carrier in the background. Uh, they, they were probably picking up people on the other side across the channel. Uh, I think that was a 50s model because of that aircraft carrier. Uh, but in that era, they used a 244 horsepower gray marine engine. Now, I, I keep mentioning these engines because the engine has had, the marine engines, or not marine engines, have had such a bearing on, on the, the growth of sport fishing boats and what they can do and where they can go because the, the weight to horsepower ratio is a big deal. You know, you can get an engine that can put out so much horsepower, but it'd be so big it'd sink the boat. So as, as the ra ratio of weight to horsepower changed, so, so did the boats. Um, this is another later, mo uh, later model Flybridge uh, sport fish boat built by the Farleys. Uh, I don't know what engines that had in it, no telling. Uh, it, it's a very good chance it had those uh, great marines. I don't know what the horsepower was on those. Somebody might. Um, and that's the way they hauled boats out here too. They had that trailer, and they had they had two things. They had an old jeep, and they also had an old Dodge power wagon. And they would uh, tie a chain on the tongue of that trailer, and ease it down, ease it down, down into the water down there off the beach where the boat ramp was is now. Where are we going from here? Okay, this is Fred Farley uh, showing the construction of the boat. And one of the unique things is the battens, uh, these were very strong boats. They had to be to uh, withstand the chop at the end of the jetties. And these boats, they, they lived forever. I mean, they lasted a long time. But each plank, uh, the, the, la the lap is over one of these battens. There's two things that does. It makes a more watertight boat, and it, it makes a stronger boat. So that's Fred Farley. That's this lady's grandpa. Uh, what we got next? Another Farley boat? Okay, that's a typical Farley boat. I'm not going to go into the President Roosevelt thing. He went fishing here. Big damn deal. A lot of people did. <laughs> But uh, this is the way they brought, you know, they just tie their fish off and drag them in. Didn't want to bring those slimy things on the boat. Plus, there wasn't that much, there wasn't that much room. You know, that was 18-foot boat. Uh, the first ones, like that one, well, that, that's kind of a later era because it's got a, a windscreen. The first ones didn't even have a windscreen. They had that little sitting area up in the bow. Uh, but uh, the first ones used Model T and Model A engines any kind of engine the guys could find. And they were usually salvaged. And they used automobile transmissions. Now, the, the automobile transmissions, the, the reverse gear was a granny gear. I mean, it was a low-ratio gear. It was as low a ratio as you could possibly even imagine. But what they would do is they would take that, that uh, reverse gear. They only used first... They used first for around the dock and third for cruising, okay? So they would swap second gear for reverse gear, and then they would use that reverse gear, which was now second gear. They would use that for, they'd run around the school of tarpon and get in front of them and troll real, real slow and let the tarpon catch up with them. Now, if you changed your engine speed or anything, even took it out of gear, those tarpon had spooked. So they could go slow enough that it didn't take all day for the tarpon to catch up with them. But that was common with those early engines. I don't know. They used automobile transmissions for a long time. I don't know when that finally ended, but uh, I don't know if it was done in later engines or not. But a lot of what I've said I remember from hearing when I was a kid, and I was just so ate up with uh, boats and fishing that I just absorbed everything I heard sitting around the dock or... You know, what, what guys were talking about at coffee in the morning. 
Uh, yeah, another thing, what they didn't say in that deal is when we'd go down there and haul those, me and Jimmy Roach was the guy that used to go with me down there. When we'd go down to the dock in the morning and haul that bait and ice and crap up and down the dock, when we had a dollar a piece, we quit. We went fishing. <laughs> so that, that'd buy us a pound of shrimp and lunch at a place that used to be over here called Miss Pete's. You could get a hamburger for about 35 cents. We call them mustard burgers. Um, see if I'm missing something here. Uh, yeah, there was something I had about uh, Farley. Uh, I got Kip Farrington, Bayless, Merritt, Wheeler. Oh, the 30s boats, a lot of Chris Crafts. Chris Craft made the boats, he's been making boats for 115, 50 years, but they made speed boats and yachts. They didn't make fishing boats. Uh, I had something that was a quote from a 1995. Uh, let me see here. Anyway, more folk history. Um, that's a pretty typical scene. You can see in the background, this isn't the picture I was thinking about. Uh, what's next? Another Farley boat. Oh, no, this was not a Farley boat. This is uh, Evan Rude. Uh, I can't even remember or say Evan Rude's first name, but he made it possible for most every, or a lot of people, uh, to go fishing out there. Now that boat has about an Evan Rude 40 on it, and uh, it, uh, it, he made the, he, he built the first one in 1907, but it took about 20 years before it became affordable for some, you know, or more affordable for guys to use. Um, I just had it. I'll tell you second year. Starlink. Phil Shook. Phil Shook. <clears throat> Sports writer Phil Shook. Uh, I've already covered all that. Uh, anyway. Okay. This was a big turning point. And I have not been able to nail down the dates on this. But uh, 1903. Okay. Because the Tarpon Club was still there. But uh, Mr. Green that owned the Tarpon Club had this power launch built. And I haven't been able to nail down what kind of engine it is, but it burned naphtha. And he had, a, he had this boat built, and there weren't any internal combustion engines around then, so nobody knew how to use or, or deal with them or work on them or fix them or service them or even what made it work. That guy driving that boat is Ed Cotter, who Cotter Street is named after. And uh, he went up to, I think it was Ohio or Illinois, where the motor was made, to go to school to learn how to maintain it. And they would tow a, a string of rowboats out to the end of the jetties for a day's fishing. And then he would anchor up or cruise around and ride herd on them and then round them all up at the end of the day to haul them back in. Um, this, my, my, my whole deal here, and I've been saying this for a lot of years, but you just saw it in black and white. I finally put it all together. Uh, Fred Farley came here in 1915, built his first boat in 1916. He was a cabinet maker by trade, but he had a contract before he came here. He had a contract with the government building lighthouses. Uh, all these guys that say that uh, John Robovich, uh, you know, really built the first uh, saltwater sport fishing boat. I'm just going to have to disagree. Uh, I think I think uh, Fred Farley did it, and I think I just proved it here tonight. Um, and if they're, uh, I'm, I'm always open for anybody 
to suggest otherwise, but I've talked to Roy Merritt, and I've talked to people from Rybovich, and uh, they are pretty much in agreement with them, with me. But they're not going to say it on <laughs> tape. <laughs> they won't say it to a camera. <laughs> uh, I was on, what got me started on this, and this is a, here we go off on these stories. Um, I got stormed in in uh, Rum Key, Bahamas, one time. And uh, there were several of us stormed in there. We were supposed to make our way out of there by boat, but couldn't get out because it, it was too rough. And uh, I had to get out of there. I had to get back. I had business to take care of. Roy Merritt, I was running a boat here, I, I mean, uh, in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, Roy Merritt had to get back for because of his business. But what triggered this was me talking to him about some of the driving for you know some of the driving forces in his boat building. He he also started built his first boat in the fifties, uh, and he's one that you know you saw the the Rolls Royce. Well, uh, Merritt boats are almost a Rolls Royce. They're awful close. They might I don't know. They're I, I can tell you that uh, Bayless has a longer waiting list with a two million dollar deposit. You know. You got to have a two million dollar deposit to put down to get on the on the waiting list. Uh, but Roy Merritt and I finally got this guy that had a single engine airplane uh, out there on the runway. We saw that airplane and started asking questions and found out the guy that owned it to come meet meet us at the bar. And he did he agreed to to fly us to San Salvador, Bahamas, where there was uh, you know commercial air service in and out, so we could go home. We got out there and opened the doors to the airplane. There weren't any seats in it. <laughs> I think he'd been in uh, flying some bales of con contraband around. Anyway, sitting on the floor of that airplane between Rumkey and San Salvador talk to, talking to Roy Merritt is one of the things that inspired me about this. I was thinking about the Farley boat way back then. But that was one of the things that inspired me to pursue it was just the conversation with him. Uh, another off on another story, he told me that in the 70s or early 80s, can't remember right along in there, the only thing that kept him going was a Texas oil man. And Texas oil people have been the driving force in a lot of sport fishing progress, buying the bigger, better, badder, faster, wanting more, you know. Uh, and wanting to beat their buddies, their competitors in the oil business usually. And uh, a guy named Ray Brown that owned a company called Brown Oil Tools, which was Hughes Oil Tool before Ray Brown bought it, uh, he bought all of Merritt's production for about four years. So if you wanted a Merritt boat, you had to buy it from Ray Brown. You know, he bought, he bought every boat they could make. And uh, he kept their business going when they probably would have gone under otherwise. So there's just a lot of Texas and all this stuff all over the world. You meet Texas fishermen everywhere you go. And I, I can, I can answer a couple of questions if people want to come up here and talk to me, but I about run out of things to say. <laughs> One more thing. This is the old Coast Guard station, and this is the old Tarpon Inn. So you can see what Port Aransas looked like in 1928. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, Marlon Perkins. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, Lloyd Dreyer was down there fishing with Marlon Perkins with a fly rod for sailfish when I was about 12 years old. I fished with Lloyd. I had the pleasure or the displeasure of fishing with uh, Lloyd. He was pretty hard on his crew. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't put up with no uh, almost or maybe. I mean, it was 100%. And you better be dressed and polished when you got to work. There was nothing more important than the owner of the boat. And the, another deal he used to call, he used to say, was sports. You know, we'd go pick up our sports at the, uh, on the Tarpon Inn. I'm sure they did over there. They had a, 
a widow walk up on top of the tarpon inn that had a flag pole, and each guide has his own flag. You know, they didn't have telephones or anything way back then. Each guide had his own flag, and if he had sports to take fishing, that's what they called their sportsmen, I guess, anglers. If he had, his flag would be flying, you know, when he got up at daylight, he could look over there the night before. If his flag was flying, he had a, he had a fishing trip. Yes, ma'am. Well, we turn them all loose now. Now you just, well, there are uh, what we call tuna bags. You know, for you know, we catch seven, eight hundred pound tuna here in the winter time. Right now is when they usually start biting giant bluefin. Uh, they're like insulated sleeping bags, and uh, you just fill them up with ice. All these boats have ice makers now. They manufacture their own ice. You turn it on, and it makes like snow ice until you turn it off. On the deck. Yep. Yeah, slide them up in those, their vinyl bags that are insulated. And you get two of them that'll, you know, the, you, get, you can get one, you can get all different sizes, but the biggest ones, you get two of them, and the Velcro around the edge is made so two of them will Velcro together. You leave the tail sticking out, usually, a lot of times. Yeah, in the fishing tournaments, we won't accept a fish that is not edible quality. You get DQ'd. The fish has to be of edible quality. And the fish that we kill in the Legends tournament and some of the other tournaments, uh, there's a food bank guy that comes down from Houston and uh, takes the meat and d distributes it somehow. He's a pastor for one of the churches. Uh, but that's his, he does that for us. Marlin are good to eat, but they're not good after they've been frozen. I don't know why, it just, it just turns all mushy and nasty. I've grilled it before. I can make it taste like a steak. It's fresh. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>